Um, so welcome. Um, this talk is performance on the wire, making websites fast. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit of uh, tools that you use to improve performance. I'm hoping it's a little bit of an unconventional talk because I think that people often approach things in a really simplistic manner. So hopefully this will broaden your tool set, but I'm certainly not going to cover everything in the realm of, of improving your performance of your site. So this will hopefully be a different way of thinking about it for you and will hopefully enlighten you on how you can go about this on your own. Um, because we were just at the keynote and Lex talked about like the nostalgia factor, this is kind of how I came about with this talk is that I started noticing as I was traveling a lot that I would get timeouts for things. Uh, you know, I couldn't access my sites on the first hit in certain countries and I got around it by moving servers around, you know, uh, move one from Canada to the US and that kind of solved it but then I went to India and there was again like delays, getting stuff, the first hit and it was like this should all just be magic and I started to realize that like your different sites, if you're developing them in the city and you're near the backbone and you're hosting nearby where you live, you may actually be geographically restricting yourself in a way. And that goes against like my initial like cool like dream of when I discovered the web was like things are global and I can access all of that. And it's kind of funny that now we find ourselves in these places where our sites are so bloated that like they don't work at my mom's house on her like equivalent to ISDN speeds in like far flung rural places and remote places and um, so anyway that got me thinking about like how do we improve the performance um, we can just go and use services but what are those services doing I used to host my own stuff and I still do with some things so this kind of got me back into hosting thinking about these issues so. Um, one of the reasons it matters is the geography of like how many people can actually get to your site. Um, that affects the mobile users more acutely because they may be on a slower connection. I know I tried to cross the border importing goods from the US and they were like, let's just see your receipt. And I'm like, it's an Amazon receipt. And they said, well, just show us your phone. And there's two bars. And it's like we're sitting there waiting and waiting. And Amazon's one of the fastest sites out there for like e-commerce purposes. So. We were lucky, I guess, because it may have just failed if it was another site in that case. Um, a lot of users will bounce, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the next slide, but Google will penalize you if your sites are slow now. So that's an important reason to take care of it. Um, I added this other one, the, the jankiness of the page. Uh, it's, it's kind of... Can you define that? <laughs> I have to define it, but it is kind of the term to use, but as the page is loading, as the assets are loading, if you're loading a font and it takes a long time to load and things are moving around on the page and like you're starting to read and suddenly the paragraph is over there, that's page jank. And it's like Google is also penalizing you for that now. So it's another thing to consider. Um, and as I said, like we're adding all of these. Now we've got fonts, we've got videos, we've got large images, we want all these banners and everything's like heavyweight. So we lose sales opportunities, we lose opportunities of like what our sites are trying to achieve. So that's kind of why we're here thinking about this today. Um, how slow is slow? And I like to go back to this like when Windows 95 was released, there was like this tool that you could use to tweak certain settings and if you had a really old computer it was super slow and so you would go and tweak those settings and they delayed the start menu by like about 280 to 300 milliseconds because it was too fast and people didn't know what was happening. So they like slowed stuff down and put animations in. So 300 milliseconds is about the blink of an eye. Like if something's going that fast, you like hit enter and you look up and you're like, why isn't, oh, it's already done. One second feels pretty fast. It's like you hit enter, spins for a second, you get your result, you don't really think about it and you're done. Three seconds is sort of, probably more normal um, for a lot of sites where you know you're loading heavy assets there's a lot of stuff on the page so that's like reasonable but then the next level I've got noted here is like 10 seconds and if you go digging around in usability studies and not just the web but like usability of computers in general 
after 10 seconds, people either leave or they think something's broken or they just like forgot what they were doing and left. And that's kind of the challenge here is like when you start to get into that territory, like it's danger zone for what you're wanting. <laughs> and I had to put this obligatory slide in because I see some of these things in Drupal all the time where it's like, if you're doing Drupal all day long and you've got all the debugging stuff enabled and the, you've got a heavy site that you're building and, and like you click on the extend page and it takes like four seconds if it's you know a base install with not many modules, but it's like 18 seconds. This is like actually what I clocked on some of my sites that I tried. Um, 18 seconds for the one that had like lots of modules in it because it's crawling through and finding everything. That's a long time. But what's even worse is the clearing the cache, and we sit here and hammer the cache clear button all day as our job. So that's like 30 to 39 seconds on a couple of my sites. And like, I don't even want to talk about the application level. We're going to skip over this in the end. But I'm just saying that like our workflow skews our interpretation of page speed. If you like sit there all day hitting cache clear and it takes like 30 to 60 seconds, you think it's normal that something should take that long. It's not. So that's, <laughs> that's the like obligatory... Maybe we're not the best judges of this, so something to consider. Um, so now when we're actually trying to improve the performance, we can like tune the application, so we could tune Drupal, and I'm not going to really talk much about that, but we can uh, think about like what is actually at play here. So we've got the connection speed, so somebody's on a 2G connection, that's going to be slower, obviously. Uh, 3G is going to be slightly faster. Um, like if they're connected by Ethernet and they're like on a T1 connection, that's going to be hopefully really fast. But then it also depends on like how much stuff is being transported. Like if it's just a 100 kilobyte file, it's going to be pretty quick. Um, distance also plays a factor because you have the time it takes to cross the continent. Like from here to the west coast is about 90 milliseconds, maybe maybe 80 on a good day, but like there's physical limitations to how long it takes. And if you cross an ocean, it's about 100 milliseconds. If you cross two oceans, it's about 200 milliseconds. And then things start timing out on you. So these are, these are problems. So you've got like connection speed, how many things we're actually trying to download, how heavy is that, how far are we trying to send it. Um, I know one thing that when Google became a thing that it was so cool that the page just loaded so fast and it like always does no matter where you are and this is kind of what I was thinking like how do I think that way and um, and then finally we've got the render time and that's kind of where we get into page jank is like does the site have all the assets it needs to do that initial render to have like a nice crisp like top half loaded you start seeing content, you're consuming it, and other stuff keeps loading, but you don't care. And that's ideally what we're looking at there. So these are challenges that we're, we're facing. And in order to address these, it's important to profile like what's happening. So um, we'll identify obvious problems. Uh, and then we can, uh, we can do most of that with browser tools that are built in. So developer tools in Chrome is what I'll show you here, but the others have the same type of functionality. Um, there's also a utility that I'll talk about a little bit called Phantomas, and it uh, uses PhantomJS headless browser, which I don't, I think may be going away in favor of the headless Chrome, but Phantomas like gathers all the statistics on a request for you and tells you things that you may want to evaluate. So we'll look at that very briefly, do a quick tour of the, the profiling stuff. Um, not the best view on the screen, but this is Chrome DevTools, so Control Shift J if you're looking at a website. And I clicked on the Network tab in the center here, and I reloaded the page after that point. And you just see that it creates this like cascade of all the assets coming in. They're color coded in this waterfall of like when the order of when things came in. You see how heavy like the requests are. Uh, so like in terms of kilobytes in this case. At the bottom of the screen, we've got some stats that are like reporting to us, like the load time was 1.01 seconds. Uh, in this case, I actually used the camp website, so uh, we've got a few different examples in here, but um, DOM content loaded, 458 milliseconds, that's pretty good. Uh, finish, again, was 101 seconds. So these numbers are slightly different because you'll have like 
you downloaded everything, and then it took some time to render. So you'll have, these are why there's different numbers here. So you can uh, look into those in your spare time. But um, if you need more details on a specific request, you can actually click the title. But what I'm really interested in is this waterfall. Like, what order are things happening to get to the end result? And then you can't see it here, but there's a red line at the edge, and that corresponds with this load figure that's like, okay, we think we're done now. There may be some Ajax stuff happening, but, but the content's there and we're good. So the neat thing about this is that if you were to be developing on a really fast computer, on a really fast connection, you can actually go to this. Uh, by default, if you click the network tab, the disabled cache will be checked. And everything except 301 and 302s will be OK for that. But 301 and 302 redirects, by the way, don't always get destroyed with that cache, but um, there's a throttle link drop down too. So going and looking at the same page but changing it to a good 2G connection um, will get us the same page that took one second to load on the previous screen, 23.95 seconds. It's like, so that's what it's going to look like on a 2G connection. That's pretty terrible. <laughs> You'll see that like in the waterfall, most of these are blue now. And then there's like a little bit of green here. So we'll like look into that and see what's causing that by just hovering over that. And this one that had green, I'm like, that's something curious. So we've got like a logo that we've attached to the bottom of the page. But it's like, why is that green before blue? It's waiting for two seconds. And it's doing a DNS lookup that took 10 milliseconds. And then I looked into it, and it's like, that's actually somebody like deep linked that to, it's, it's actually from coming from Kalamuna's website. <laughs> so we should have downloaded that and put that into our theme. And I didn't even tell the people that were working on the site that this is a thing, but I'll tell them after and we'll fix it. But, but it's like, that's a thing, right? If you notice that, oh, that's actually hosted on our dev server, it's doing another DNS lookup, now we've caught that issue. Technically, it's live and it's fine, but technically, Kalamuna could delete that image or like put some porn in its place or something and we would look kind of stupid. So we can fix that. That's a really easy fix. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you do on this first pass, just using browser tools. So a lot of people will just kind of do this type of thing and stop here. Um, this time I changed it to 3G, so now we're at 15 seconds to load, which is still like kind of terrible. But <laughs> um, And then I looked at this other one, it's like this one, it just keeps going. Why is that one so long? You see there's no DNS request for it here, so that's good. We're saving at least that 10 milliseconds. We're also saving the transcontinental, like, time to get to California and back. Um, but the content download itself took 12.70 seconds. So that's like that's our big banner image that you see when you get to the camp website. We could probably optimize that down because it's kind of like similar color set, so it, it would probably optimize well in JPEG to just like lower the amount until it's almost fuzzy. But th the really simple, easy wins. Um, once we've done that, it's like we might want to like automate this process and make sure that we're auditing it on a regular basis. And as I mentioned, Phantomas is a good tool for that. So in this case, I passed it the www address of this website, and it redirects to 2017 dot whatever whatever, and it does all that. But we get this huge report of like all of the statistics pertaining to the website. I can't find my mouse. Where is my mouse? Okay, so you see like we've got requests, there's 20 requests that happen to load this page, which we could have calculated from that Chrome report, but this just does it as a total. Gzip requests, so of those 20, 10 of them were gzipped by the server, so they're like getting compressed by the server, probably a tenth of what it was to start with, so 10% of the download speed roughly. The body size of the content was like almost 200 kilobytes. Um, the content length, though, were like 1.2 megabytes overall with all the assets included. And like the HTTP traffic took 2.5 seconds, 2,545 milliseconds. So 
Uh, time to first byte, time to last byte. You can look at all these numbers. Uh, there's a couple of them that have bugs, but like the idea is that you can see how long it took to get the data, how long it took to get all of the assets, how long it took to render the JavaScript and all that stuff to give you a kind of a complete picture of what's happening. And if we scroll further down in here, again, I don't know why I can't see my mouse in here, but um, if you scroll down, it has like each image asset listed out like this one doesn't have a width and a height, and that will contribute to page jank. Like while the page is loading, it doesn't know how big that box should be. So like everything's going to get moved around when it finally discovers that. So it will tell you that further on in that, that report. Um, and then you can just take those as your easy wins. So then for easy wins, we're basically reducing our connection speed while we're developing or running tests with reduced speeds, um, reducing the number of files. So when I said it takes longer to go across the ocean, if you want to get something to somebody really fast, you can start looking at that Chrome chart and going like, well, if, it's, if we're like, going across an ocean, it's like 200 millisec or 100 milliseconds each way. And like it's going and fetching this other thing after it's done that, and that thing's only like 30K. Well, like including that 30K thing in the original request will save that user overseas like you know, 200 milliseconds minus 30. So like you save them 170 milliseconds by like inlining something as opposed to just having it as an additional file that comes in later. So that's something that you can start thinking about is like if I reduce the number of files, I reduce the number of round trips, which means that somebody across the ocean isn't like flying back and forth Montreal to Paris 25 times to get your content. Maybe they only flew across the ocean five times. Um, optimizing images and video is sort of obvious. Um, sprites can be used, like if you have interface elements that are a bunch of icons, you can embed them all in one file and show sh sections of that's kind of a classic hack to I improve the performance. SVG is now widely supported in browsers um, to a good extent, so you can do a lot of your icons as SVG, which are vector art, so rather than having like a thousand pixels to define your like little icon. You could do it with like maybe six dots, and it just renders lines in between. So those are ways to improve, um, like lower the payload. Uh, I mentioned gzipping on the server uh, can save you a lot of bandwidth. The way that's done in the Apache web server is you say like everything with this file extension, add this header that allows it to be compressed, basically. So you just say, like, all these file types will get compressed on the way out. Um, things that are already compressed, you don't want to recompress because it doesn't really get you much other than wasted CPU cycles. But like things like text, HTML, really good to gzip. Um, makes a huge difference because like if it's 10% of the transmission, um, like you're saving on that physical t time and distance. So. Um, and then you can create a phantom S profile once you define like, okay, this is what I think, you know, I looked at one of our sites that we work on, it had 70 requests to load the homepage because they kept adding trackers and this and marketing kept adding more and more and more. We redeveloped the site and we were like, you're allowed to make 20 requests, that's it. And like, they don't really think about the page speed, but we have to be the people to lead them to like embrace the best practices to like, say, you know, hey, maybe we can get by with like one tracking code or two as opposed to 25. Um, so we can create a Phantom S profile out of that. And the neat thing about this is there's a, you can make a .json file and provide that as a parameter just at, appended to the end of that Phantom S string that I showed earlier. So Phantom S, URL, and then file name .json. And in this file, you have like, uh, so asserts is the, the key, and then these are the values. There's an example if you go look up Phantom S. But I decided to test on only these elements, and I want it only to access at most three domains. So if somebody goes and embeds content from another source, that would be a fourth domain, then like this is going to fail. I'm going to say, why is that hosted on a different server? That Because then we're making more DNS requests. It's just more things. Uh, 20 requests is the maximum we want. We want at least five of those to be gzipped at all times. We want the body size to be no more than 100 kilobytes. 
and you know it goes on. So we want DOM complete to be 300 milliseconds because after that we're just waiting for JavaScript to load. I might have clicked something and then JavaScript came in and it's just like 300 milliseconds, pretty reasonable I think. But uh, and it's important to run it periodically, like keep auditing yourself because you'll you'll find like surprising things happen. You do an update, suddenly one of the figures changed and you may not have caught it. So that's all good. We've like figured out how to like optimize our payload, think about reducing our number of files that we're sending, start thinking about sending things over oceans. Um, this is really like talking about latency. So it's like how long does it take to get somewhere? But I say also it's also reducing the distance because like time and distance have like physical limitations. So um, the way you test these is that you test well, the way that I've been testing these things, I guess I should say, I test the DNS latency, I test the HTTP GET request, so just like GET home page, getting that one file, how long does that take? This is actually a really reliable, well, fairly reliable test because it will show you just like what your raw speed looks like. Um, you can do page load tests as well, and these ones uh, try to capture, Phantomass is trying to do a page load test, basically. It's like, Let's get the page and all of the assets and see what this really looks like to the user. So um, I ended up using this service, and there's a bunch of different services out there, but this one's called Map Latency. And basically, you put in a URL address, and uh, I think the first three options are free, and then you might have like up to five per day of the other ones. It's like 10 euros a month or something for the service. But Anyway, you put in a URL, and I chose the DNS test to see what the DNS latency looks like. And of course, like here in Montreal, I had my server running in New York City. Like it comes back like ten to twelve milli, well, ten to twenty milliseconds on a bad 20, 20 on a bad day. Um, but like really quick from New York. But then you go like across the ocean, and it's like oh, it's a bit different. And you'll start to see stuff like that. Um, in this case, our Drupal Camp Montreal one, I can't remember who our DNS provider is, but it's one of the big ones, probably Cloudflare or something. So it's like these are all really nice numbers on the DNS in this case, because we're just using a managed service. Um, testing page load in HTTP GET gets a bit more interesting. So let's like look at that. So we're going to look at this now a bit differently. Like, How do we optimize our infrastructure so that we're getting our requests to our users? So for DNS, I'm going to try to reduce, uh, when I tested my site that was just like something I managed myself, I was finding that like when I went overseas and I would type in my address and hit enter, it would spin and spin and spin and time out. And it's like, well, that's not ideal. So what I wanted to do is make sure that if I do a global query, so the way that map latency service works is that it's got testing nodes all over the world and it just says, hey, try to get this thing. And then you get these results back from different connection types. And what you'll find is like, yeah, in, in like Australia and like India and especially Brazil, there's like, you get timeouts for things that should be fairly trivial. They're not that far off the network in some cases. But so we want to we wanna fix that problem. Uh, HTTP GET, we want to see how long does it take to get the first reply. So we can then think about optimizations for that. And then finally, we'll test the page load just to see. Um, the page load gets interesting when you start reducing the number of files. You start to see that you get a lot more replies back from the testing service. So I kind of made this into, like, this is the way I, the order in which I implemented it. And this is kind of just like, a bit of backgrounder for the charts I'm going to show you, but the charts are kind of fuzzy information because you're kind of just putting out this request, seeing what comes back. If it's like evening hours in North America, especially New York time zone that we're in here, that like if you query at a busy time of day in one region, it's going to sway the results a bit. So like having a global spread helps, but you're going to get variations in your results back. So. Um, what I decided to do, and this was kind of just a result of experimentation, but I decided to make an Nginx reverse proxy. And this was complete accident of me experimenting in my spare time. Like, could I make a static web server? And I was like, oh, rather than FTP the files, I can just put proxy pass and an HTTP URL. And 
it was like a huge performance improvement. I couldn't believe it. And you'll see a chart and it's just like, wow, okay, <laughs> that was huge. We often use Varnish as a front end cache for Drupal. Same idea, you'll get roughly the same results. I chose Nginx just because I was looking at it for other stuff and I tripped on this and was like, wow, that made Drupal so much faster. So we want to make that endpoint into a cache. It's basically our, um, what I'm going to do is I'm basically going to say I'm going to make a couple endpoints. So there's a reverse proxy in New York and there's a reverse proxy in Frankfurt and the, the website actually lives in New York. But for somebody that hits that Frankfurt server, they're just going to get a cache of it. So if they're in anywhere in Europe, they're going to get that like really fast. But it also improves performance for India because like if it times out trying to get to North America, it's going to go to that closer connection. And I did this like the laziest way possible where I just like, I, I, I've been running my own DNS for a long time and I thought, you know, it's kind of meant to be distributed. So let's just use it as it's designed. So the so warning of like, I'm not doing load balancers. I'm not doing anything fancy here. I'm just like, Let's just use DNS and HTTP. And that's basically our new HTTP endpoint. And we're going to hide our real Drupal server behind that. So it's almost like a second firewall. Um, distribute the DNS globally to reduce timeouts. And this is one of the earlier changes I made, too. And more endpoints provide quicker responses overseas. So the way it works is that like usually you have two DNS addresses. Um, you can provide more. Um, and what I did is I just, I had one in New York and one in San Francisco. I added Frankfurt and then I added, uh, I think it's Bangalore is the other one. And that was helpful. And then, and then finally I went through a process of just tuning all of that stuff just to see how far I could get it. So, um, so with the DNS, I, I didn't even bother like sorting the results. Like I didn't bother looking up the IP address and segmenting it. I just put a bunch of I just put four addresses there, and surprisingly, like sometimes they'll hit this server, sometimes they'll hit that server, but more often than not, you end up hitting the local, the closest one to you, just because upstream at your provider they prefer certain IP addresses over others, and the network infrastructure kind of just does this stuff. It's not really supposed to, but people have been optimizing for years and years and they want things to be cheaper on their networks, so they prefer certain blocks of IP addresses. Some browsers will try things in different orders. Sometimes the browser relies on the operating system to do the lookup, but they all kind of have these failover properties and they behave slightly differently, but they often tend to prefer local-ish. And if it ever tries to go to a a further one, you know, whatever. But um, DNS also gets cached by your local ISP anyway. So, like, really, to a user, this isn't a huge deal. But it is a huge deal when you start to see, like, here was our DNS results that we got back. So there was a tab on that website where I could just download a CSV, so I started doing that. And we've got quite a few replies that are over 50 milliseconds. So the 50 millisecond line is here. And we've got, like, we got about, like, 52 users that got through in under 50 milliseconds. And then we start to see this climb as we get into, so like one of these far off ones are like, that's probably where I was vacationing when it didn't come through. It was like I was hitting, maybe I was hitting that line or just over it. Now we add a third server and like suddenly now we've got like, we're up to like, we're in the 60s now for like, we've got 60 replies back that are under 50 milliseconds, but now instead of 77 replies total, now we're getting like 88 replies. So like we're, more users are seeing that thing on the first hit and more of them are seeing it under 50 milliseconds. So that's kind of cool. I like to think about this like you have a theater and like, how many people can you get in the theater? And it's like, now we've got 10 more seats in our theater. So that's really cool. Um, and then finally, I add the fourth server. And now we're up to like 99 to 100 replies are coming back. And like the under 50 is like we've got like mid 60s are coming in under 50 milliseconds. So that's like our entire first slide are now all under 50 milliseconds and we're getting like all of those other people. So like 
we got 25% improvement of like people just getting the address on the first hit. So that's like way better. I don't know how far this thing goes, but like um, if you do comparisons with the big services like Cloudflare and whatnot, you see a similar arc. So they may have like a, you know, slightly more that are under less, under 10 milliseconds, uh, but they do more optimization around stuff and they load balance things. So there's like other things going on, but this is just using pure DNS. It's just really the most basic stuff. So um, now if we look at the HTTP latency, we'll see what the reverse proxy did. And basically, again, we're putting something in front of Drupal and when we're in Drupal and we enable the caches, it puts a header on our content that says this is cacheable for up to one hour, one day. Um, if you're in views, you can add that as an option and you should always generally like add a cache even for one minute just so that if you've got a lot of traffic influx, you can deal with that. Um, so again, I'm just like no load balancer. I'm just basically, I'm doing two reverse proxies and when I reply from the DNS with my address, I actually just give two addresses. I don't care who takes what address, just like whatever works. And if the New York server, the New York reverse proxy goes down, everyone will go through Frankfurt, but everyone will still get there, even though it might be slightly longer. But um, so it's a really simple strategy. But like, here's what it was before, terrible. It's like, we've got, so we've got, this is up to 6,000 milliseconds is how high our chart is going. And we got like 105 replies. And as you see, like the, it just gets like worse and worse. And like, that's just for getting index.html or whatever it is. And then you put a reverse proxy in front of it. And then like, boom, we've got this like arc that's forming now. And now we're getting like, so how many were we at? We've got under one second, we've got 16 users at the start. Under one second, now we've got about 44 users that got the same content in under one second. There's no change to this. There's an Apache server behind the scenes slapping an Nginx reverse proxy in front of that, just providing a URL, one line of code. It's like huge <laughs> improvement. So now we've got like 45 people in under a second. We've got like about 85 people under two seconds and under three seconds, we like 115 people or so. Like it's huge improvement and then we go further and we add the DNS servers into that mix and suddenly now we've got like 85 users that are under that one second mark, our scale of the thing has changed now. Um, under three seconds, we've got like 139 responses. So like now this is starting to behave more like Google's homepage where like if I'm in Africa and I type in my address and hit enter, I'm probably going to get it. So that's really exciting because combining the distributed like more DNS servers plus having like two reverse proxies has like made that huge. And then this last thing that we did was like we were still seeing like sometimes we would get like different hits and Drupal's maximum cache is like one day by default if you just use the core settings. And so once a day, and if it's like some never trafficked website like the one I was working with here, the first time you hit it the first day, it's got to generate that cache. So if you hit the Frankfurt server, it's got to like say, oh no, this is expired, just wait, I'm going to go to New York. 100 milliseconds later, New York is like, yeah, it's the same. And it comes back another 100 milliseconds later. So that request just took like potentially 300 milliseconds for that person just to get the request filed, let alone download anything. But now, I went and looked through all the documentation in Nginx and it's like, wait a second, I know this site doesn't really have a lot of like up-to-date content on a daily basis. So what I did is I set it to serve the expired cache and while it's doing that, issue the request for new content in the background. So that one user that's hitting the expired cache has triggered the refresh for the next user and therefore no user ever gets served the live content. So ne nobody ever hits that 300 millisecond tax now because that just happens behind the scenes. They get the stale content, but we know it's like never updated. So this is basically a static site now is really what it is to the user. It's just like fast and it works. So that is like 
really easy wins again. Like I was surprised that I had never looked into building my own reverse proxy. I had it as a job interview question once, and I was like, you just put in this URL and you give it a path for your server. That's pretty much it. That's all I know. I've never done it before. That's really all it is. <laughs> like, and I was like, oh, I answered that question correctly like two years after I had that in an interview. Um, and I did get that job. But <laughs> Now we'll look at the page load. This is lar largely like a repetition of just getting that one HTTP get. But now what we're seeing is like the HTTP get we get that index.html, and then we go and fetch every asset. So we should see, like, like you see here, this is horrible. It's really, really terrible. At 10 seconds, eight users have received the website under, like, the non-configured, just plain old, old Ubuntu, old Apache server. Eight users were getting this website DOM complete. 10 seconds is terrible. And that's just like, that was out of the box. I think that the cache was enabled. But you see like, as soon as it starts to get like further away from, this is probably all like Montreal and New York area. And then everybody else is screwed. It's just like 20 seconds, yeah right, I'm not going to this website anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but now when we get the reverse proxies in there, like we've got less round trip traffic and shorter distances and it's cached on the server. It's not like looking through Drupal's information to see if it's fresh. It's just Nginx knows. And now we've got well, 10 seconds. Now I've got like 62-ish users that are coming in under 10 seconds with all of the content. So you see it still progressively goes up a little bit. And if you were to, I don't have a slide for this, but I did experiments with just like serving a single file, like inlining the CSS, Base64 encoding the images, just like throw everything in one file, and what you'll find is that it won't, it'll go like this, and then it will just hook up at the end. And that's because there's no round trips. Like most of these are the people across the ocean. So this is the ocean tax that you're seeing here. It's like each time you cross an ocean, it's like one more file, one more file. Go back across the ocean, one more file. And if it's just one file, it's just going to be like, boom, straight across, and then you'll have some at the end where they're like difficult to reach internet places. Um, see a bit more of this. I can probably like stop on this topic now, but uh, you'll see that like you add more mirrors, you get better results. You put caches in front of things, you get better results. Um, for anything that's not cacheable, you'll want to... Um, oh yeah, this is... Okay, this last one's sort of interesting. So adding no more DNS with the full page load helped again. I don't really know why in that case, but and then we tuned things so we're serving the stale cache. And the stale cache really helped when you're getting more assets, because like I guess what was happening is in the background they were, you know, having to check the cache status on a lot of things. So lastly, like application tuning, the thing I didn't really want to talk about, you like optimize what you can't cache. Like if you've got a view that's really heavy because it's live data from like a sporting event that's going on, then like optimize the performance of that or maybe cache it for one second or cache it for a minute, but like optimize what you can't cache. Like that's, that's where you do that. And there's lots of talks about that for optimizing like PHP or Drupal or whatever it is that you're using. Um, and then if you are doing Drupal, the ADV AGG advanced aggregation module um, is like an alternative caching module and you can use that to bundle your CSS into fewer files. Um, so that's a, an option. And another option that's sort of in the realm of possibilities with Drupal is to do kind of a headless Drupal approach or maybe you don't want to include Drupal's JavaScript and CSS in your theme, which is danger zone, by the way. It wrecks your accessibility stuff in some cases. So <laughs> there's, you start to think about these things like, do I really need this is really what it comes down to in a lot of cases. And um, I found that like for things like fonts for my own website, for like a blog, I don't need it to have a downloadable font. I want people to just see the content. So that's changed my thinking on some of that stuff too, because a lot of our mobile phones, desktop operating systems have these really nice built-in fonts, so just use them. Um, 
and then we time out. So uh, we've got a few minutes for questions, uh, and otherwise we can just run for lunch and try to get ahead and start on everybody else. <laughs> Matt? Um, great talk. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, uh, nice to hear about it. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> uh, it was like down to here before. So it's, um, my question: the, the, the sound that was super interesting. How you set up your own reverse like cache? So you're doing your own edge, edge proxy. You're your own Cloudflare because you don't like Cloudflare. Yeah, I use Cloudflare for some things, and Fastly is really good too. But I was just sort of like, wow, that was easier than I thought. Uh, so was this like is is your takeaway like? I, you can do better than Fastly? Or are you saying, like, you, here's what you do if you don't feel like paying Fastly's rates? Uh, a little bit of both. I did a comparison graphic, and, oh, do I? Yeah, I do have it up here. Is this the one? Wait. Oh, no, that's not the right one. Never mind. Um, but yeah, I did do a comparison with, like, a live site that I have that uses Cloudflare, and the it's like their numbers were slightly lower than mine, but it, it was this exact same curve that I came to. And I was like, wow, this is like kind of cool. That's what they're doing. Yeah, it's more or less, this is exactly what they're doing on their end. They've got a little bit more going on. Like they, I think they have a custom Nginx module that like works together with the caching. Because what the one thing that Cloudflare does that's sort of interesting is that they'll take chunks of your page and cache it and like reassemble your page. So there's like they've gone to another level of caching for that. But but yeah, it's kind of the, this is the basics and it gets you like 95% of the way there. <laughs> and where Cloudflare gets expensive is like when you're getting attacked, but like if you have like been managing servers and you're able to do this, this is like a really simple way to self-host or um, I also talked about it with someone in the context of like they're only allowed to host in Canada and I said, well, why not put endpoints in New York and in Europe that connect to your Canadian hosted server, and that way you'll have like global reach. You've met your objective to host it in Canada, but you're just you've got these spools running, like bringing stuff in for you on like good known good channels. Um, what often happened to like when I was at uh, DrupalCon Barcelona is that you make a request and like. A bunch of the assets come back, the index.html comes back, but like one CSS file is missing or something like a reset happened on the line. Spain has really flaky internet connections sometimes. <laughs> yeah, uh, so maybe the other questions or comments? Other strategies that people have done? <laughs> no? Okay, well, happy building HTML and have fun with the Drupal camp. And <laughs> Thank you.